Hi, my name is Jeff Hoffman, and this is the Genetics Lecture of Biochemistry. This chart lists the basic genetic terms you should be familiar with. Codominance occurs when neither of two alleles are dominant or recessive, but both contribute to the phenotype in a heterozygote. An example would be blood types. This means that in patients who are heterozygous, or have one of each type of allele, A and B, each allele has an effect. Variable expression is when the individuals who have the same genotype have a different phenotype. For example, two individuals who both have the same mutation in NF1 can have different presentations of neurofibromatosis. Incomplete penetrance is when not all individuals with a certain mutant genotype show any kind of phenotype. This is different from variable expression, since in the case of variable expression, all patients show some type of phenotype, it just varies from one to the next. An example of incomplete penetrance is the BRCA1 mutation, which can cause breast cancer in some people but has no effect in others. Pleiotropy is when a genotype can cause multiple different phenotypic effects. For example, patients with PKU, which is caused by mutation in phenylalanine hydroxylase, can have a few seemingly unrelated phenotypes, such as mental retardation, lighter colored skin, hair, and eyes, sometimes even a smaller head. Imprinting occurs when a disease phenotype depends on whether a mutation was inherited from the patient's mother or father. We'll cover some examples of this soon, such as prater willi and Angelman syndrome. But basically this can happen because some genes are repressed by heritable epigenetic marks, such as methylation, only in the male or female germline. This may seem like a strange regulatory strategy, but it makes sense if we consider another example, which is that a lot of genes are regulated by imprinting play a role in growth and development of the fetus. This is because the male and female parents have different priorities. The male parent, from the perspective of evolutionary fitness, wants an offspring that is big and strong, and therefore some genes that are expressed only from the male parent cause the fetus and placenta to become larger. On the other hand, the mother has an interest in self-preservation, so genes that are expressed in the fetus only from maternal chromosomes often act to reduce the size of the fetus and invasiveness of the placenta. Anticipation is the process by which the severity of a disease worsens or the age of onset of the disease is earlier in succeeding generations. In other words, if your maternal grandfather has a mild disease and then your mother has a moderate version of this disease, and you would have the most severe version. An example of this is Huntington's disease, which we'll talk more about later. Loss of heterozygosity implies that if a patient inherits or develops a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, the complementary allele must also be mutated or deleted before this will permit a neoplastic transformation, since only one functional copy is needed to prevent this. This is also referred to as a two-hit hypothesis, and some examples of genes that fit this description are p53 and retinoblastoma. This is not the same thing as an oncogene, which only requires one mutant allele for cancer to develop, since they have gain-of-function mutations. A dominant negative mutation is one that prevents normal function of the gene, but has a dominant effect. So even if only one allele has a dominant negative mutation, its protein product will prevent the protein product of the wild-type allele from functioning. This can occur with some transcription factors, where a mutated non-functional transcription factor can still bind to DNA, but has lost its ability to regulate transcription. However, it blocks the normal copy from binding as well. Linkage disequilibrium is the tendency for certain alleles at two linked loci to be inherited together more often than you would expect by chance. This is a statistical term, which is referring to a population, not to a family or individual. So what do I mean by linked loci? This means that the loci, or genes, are on the same chromosome. For example, let's say you have two genes, A and B, and each gene has two alleles in the population, a big A and a little a, and a big B and a little b. If both alleles of both genes have been around for many generations, and neither confers a selective advantage, you should see equal amounts of each allele of each gene. Also, you expect to see big and little a's and b's mixed together evenly. Linkage disequilibrium is when these ratios are not all the same. For example, maybe 90% of people with a big A have a big B, and only 10% of people with a big A have a little b. The most common reason for this is if one of the alleles was recently introduced to the population, in which case it will be inherited more commonly with other genes that it came with when it was introduced. In other words, these genes are linked. Mosaicism occurs when some cells in the body have a different genetic makeup than others. This can only be caused by events that occur after fertilization, since anything that happened earlier will have the same effect on all cells of the developing embryo. Mosaicism can be caused by mutations that occurred during embryogenesis. For example, if a patient would have had an AB blood type, but a deletion of the A gene occurs in a cell that gives rise to half of the hematopoietic system, then half of the patient's blood cells will be AB, and the other half will just be B. A second cause of mosaicism is if two zygotes form, which would have ended up as dizygotic twins, except they fuse together very early in embryogenesis. Now half of the cells will have the genotype that one twin would have had, and the other half of the cells have the genotype of what the other twin would have had. One last example is a germline mosaic, which is when a mutation occurs that only affects cells that will give rise to the germline. This will have no effect on that individual, but will affect their offspring. The offspring will not have mosaicism since they will be derived entirely from one of their parent cells, but they can have a mutation that was not present in their parent's somatic cells, causing a disease that the parent did not have. 
I also want to point out that random X chromosome inactivation in females, or lionization, is not an example of mosaicism, since all cells have the same genetic material. The only differences between cells are epigenetic, which doesn't count as mosaicism because even in males, different cell types have epigenetic differences, such as a neuron compared to a hematopoietic cell. Locus heterogeneity is when mutations at different loci, or in different genes, produce the same phenotype. This can occur if two genes have the same function, or if they act in sequence in a pathway. For example, Marfan syndrome, MEN2B, and homocystinuria can all result in a Marfanoid habitus, which means the patient is tall and thin with long fingers and joint hypermobility. There are also several genetic mutations that can cause albinism, such as in genes responsible for production of melanin and genes involved in the transport of melanin from melanocytes to keratinocytes. Heteroplasmy is when two different versions of mitochondrial DNA both exist in the same cell. Since you only inherit mitochondria from one parent, your mother, this occurs due to new mutations and not the inheritance of different genotypes. A single mutation can propagate, resulting in some mitochondria having the mutated form and others having the normal form, and both can be passed on to new cells during division, which is especially important if it happens to be in the egg or soon after fertilization since more cells can potentially inherit the mutated DNA. This can result in variable expression of a mitochondrial disease, depending on how many cells get how much of the mutant DNA. In this example I've drawn, you can see that all the mitochondrial have the same DNA. Then in the second cell, a mutation occurs, and by the third cell, the mutation is spread to other mitochondria, by which I mean it hasn't spread, but that mitochondria has divided. Our last term is uniparental disomy, which occurs when an offspring receives two copies of a chromosome from one parent and no copies from the other parent. There are two types, heterodisomy and isodisomy. Heterodisomy is caused by an error in meiosis part 1, and results in having one of each homologous chromosome from the same parent. Isodisomy is caused by an error in meiosis part 2, which as you can see here would result in having two identical chromosomes. It can also be caused by a duplication of one chromosome and a loss of the other. So what's the effect of uniparental disomy? Usually nothing. The patient is euploid, which means they have the correct number of chromosomes, so they'll often have no disease traits and have no fertility problems. However, in the case of isodisomy, if the parent was a carrier for an autosomal recessive genetic disease, their offspring will end up with two copies and thus have the disease. This can sometimes look like in printing, since again you're only receiving genes that can be expressed from one parent. These equations are used to describe the frequencies with which alleles of a gene occur in a population. Here, we use P and Q to refer to the two alleles in the same way that I used big A and little a earlier. So what does Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium mean? Basically, just that the ratio of P to Q does not change over time. For this to be true, four conditions have to be met. First, no new mutations can occur. Neither P nor Q can confer a selective advantage compared to the other. Mating is random and not affected by genotype, and no individuals will enter or leave the population. If all of these conditions are met, then the ratio of P and Q will not change over time, or in other words, the population will be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So why is that important? Because it allows you to do some simple calculations to learn about the prevalence of individuals with a disease, or carriers of a disease, if you know the allele frequencies. We'll start with the basics. P plus Q equals 1 since we're assuming that P and Q are the only two alleles. If 40% of the alleles are P, then the other 60% have to be Q, so the total is 100% or 1. If P is 10%, then what's Q? Right, Q would be 90%. Okay, how about this other equation, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1? Let's break it down. P squared and Q squared are the proportions of the population that are homozygous for P and Q. So if P equals 50%, or 0.5, then P squared is 0.25, which means 25% of the individuals in the population are homozygous for P. So how about if Q is 0.1? What percent of individuals would be homozygous for Q? Right, 1% of individuals would be homozygous for Q. 2PQ is the proportion of heterozygotes, since individuals can only be homozygous for P, homozygous for Q, or heterozygous, and have one of each allele, the sum of these three groups has to equal 1. Okay, let's do an example of something you might see in an exam. Let's say 1% of individuals in a population have an autosomal recessive disease, and you have to figure out what percent of the alleles in the population are not mutant. This means that 1% of individuals are homozygous for the mutant allele. We can assign P to be the mutant allele, and Q to be the normal one. So what does P squared equal? Right, 0 0.01. Since P squared is a proportion of individuals who are homozygous for P, and the question told us that 1% of the population have the disease. You can solve this for P by taking the square root of each side, which leaves you with P equals 0.1. Now we're trying to find what percent of alleles are not mutant, so basically we're trying to find what Q is. Now if we know P is 0.1, then to find Q we just have to use our equation P plus Q equals 1. 
If we substitute 0.1 in for p, then subtract it from each side, we end up with q equals 0.9, which is the answer to your question. Okay, as promised, we return to imprinting. Do you remember what that means? Right, it's when a gene's expression, and therefore the phenotype it produces, depends on which parent it was inherited from. This can be caused by methylation of that gene's promoter in one parent's germline. For example, let's say in one person, the allele from one parent is imprinted, and the other is expressed. In the germline, these old imprints are erased, leaving a blank slate. Then, depending on the sex of the individual, new imprints are made. So in this case, the gene can be expressed in chromosomes coming from the mother, but not in chromosomes inherited from the father. Now let's say this gene has a mutation in it, here. The mother will not be affected, since this copy is imprinted anyway, and she has a second copy which is expressed. However, if her offspring ends up with that copy, they're in trouble, since the only other copy they get is the imprinted version from their father. This is the case in Angelman syndrome, in which the maternal allele is deleted or mutated, and the father's allele is normal but imprinted. Patients with Angelman will have mental retardation, seizures, ataxia, and inappropriate laughter, and the combination of these has led to its nickname the happy puppet. prater willi syndrome is similar, but is caused by deletion or mutation of the normally active paternal allele and an imprinted maternal allele. This causes mental retardation, hyperphagia, obesity, hypogonadism, and hypotonia. The genes that cause both of these are on chromosome 15. These syndromes can also be caused by uniparental disomy, as I mentioned earlier. Because if a gene is imprinted by one parent, and the offspring receives both alleles from that parent, then they won't have a copy of the gene they can express. There are a few different ways in which genetic traits can be inherited. Autosomal dominant phenotypes occur when at least one copy of the allele that corresponds to that phenotype is present. Therefore, this can affect many successive generations, and affects both male and female offspring equally. The really nasty autosomal dominant genetic diseases typically only present later in life, after puberty. Can you think of why that might be? Well, if they presented earlier, then they would almost never be passed on to future generations, especially if they're fatal or cause severe disfigurement. However, if they present only later in life, like Huntington's disease, then they can be passed on. In contrast, autosomal recessive diseases are able to present early in life, but still be passed on via carriers, who have one copy of the gene but no phenotype, since the phenotype only presents when both copies of the gene are mutated. So why do you need both copies to be mutated? Because autosomal recessive disorders are usually from having an inactive protein, but having only one inactive copy will not produce a phenotype, since the other copy can still work, and the enzyme's job will still get done. To inherit an autosomal recessive disease, both parents have to be at least carriers, and if they're both heterozygous, then their offspring has a 25% chance to be affected. So here's a question. If both parents are carriers, what's the probability that the offspring will be a heterozygote? That would be 50%. If it's a more mild disease, then homozygous affected parents can also produce offspring, which increases the odds of the offspring having a disease phenotype. Since most disease alleles are rare in the general population, autosomal recessive diseases are rarely seen in more than one generation in a row. Since a diseased individual is unlikely to produce offspring with another individual who carries the disease, except in the case of incest. X-linked recessive disorders are more likely to occur in males than females. That's because males have only one X chromosome, so if it's affected, then they have the disease. Do you know which parent males inherit an X-linked recessive disease from? Right, that would be their mother, since they get an X chromosome from their father. Females need to get two affected copies to fully have the disease, which is very uncommon. Now why do I say fully have the disease? Well, as I mentioned earlier, female cells inactivate one copy of the X chromosome randomly in each cell during embryogenesis, so only cells that have the X chromosome that carries the disease as their active X will be affected. However, this will be a less severe phenotype than in males, and in some cases isn't even detectable. For example, color blindness is due to an X-linked recessive mutation, but if even half of the female cells are able to detect color, she will probably never notice that anything is unusual about her vision. X-linked dominant disorders can be inherited from the mother or the father, but all female offspring of an affected male will be affected, since men only have one X to give their daughter. One example of an X-linked dominant disease is hypophosphatemic rickets. We'll talk more about that later. The last inheritance pattern we'll cover is mitochondrial. Since everyone's mitochondria come from their mother, these can only be passed down through the maternal lineage. Also, all of the offspring of an affected woman will be affected. Examples of these diseases include mitochondrial encephalopathy, myoclonic epilepsy, and Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, which causes degeneration of retinal ganglion cells and axons, ultimately causing loss of central vision. Why might these cells be affected? Well, mitochondrial defects will cause the most problems in cells that require lots of energy, which includes retinal ganglion cells and particularly active neurons. You may also see ragged red fibers on muscle histology, which are clumps of diseased mitochondria.